In the last section, we saw how to reconstruct 3D geometry from not one, but two images. And I want to briefly return to that, in particular, in the context of uh, the original perspective projection models um, that we did at the very beginning of the semester. So let me remind you what that looked like. You have an object out in the world, this three-dimensional object. It is denoted by XW, YW, ZW, world coordinates. And of course, I've added in this uh, one here because I'm going to do everything in homogeneous coordinates. It is related to the camera coordinate through a rigid body transformation, a rotation, and a translation. So that T term hits the one here to get us into camera coordinate systems. This, of course, is the extrinsic matrix. We then multiply that by the intrinsic matrix consisting of the focal length on the diagonal. Cx, Cy are the offsets of the image uh, coordinate system and the camera coordinate system. And then finally, we multiply by that lambda, which converts from real world units, meters, centimeters, to pixels. That eventually gives us image coordinates in homogeneous coordinates. So x, s, y, s, s. We divide by that homogeneous coordinate s, and we get pixels from things in the world being imaged to the uh, image sensor. And that was the model we derived at the very beginning of the semester. And perfectly right. Uh, and we also saw that because this matrix is three by four, in fact, the product of these is three by four, there is a reduction in dimensionality. We are going from a three-dimensional world to a two-dimensional world. There is an inherent loss of information. And in the last section, we use two cameras to resolve that ambiguity. And that's really sort of the best you can do without some special optics and special camera. But here's an interesting case. What happens when the world is not a complex three-dimensional object, but it's a flat surface? I mean, it's certainly out in the three-dimensional world, but it itself is flat. And we're going to talk a little bit about this very special case when you're looking at things like signs or walls or somebody holding up a placard. What does this imaging model look like? So let's play the same game. I've got a point out in the world. I've got my extrinsic matrix. I have my intrinsic matrix. And I get my image coordinates. But again, there's something very special here, which is this isn't really a fully three-dimensional object. So in particular, that z sub w in the world coordinate system is 0. Well, why is it 0? Well, I can define my world coordinate system. I can define that on this no parking sign, this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis, and the z-axis is going in and out. And all of those coordinates, by definition, are 0. By the way, here's a case where you can really see the benefit of being able to specify things in world coordinates, not in camera coordinates. So in world coordinates, I can simply arbitrarily set the coordinate system of this object. And I'm going to say that zw is 0. And now you see that this is an inherently two-dimensional surface. It only has an, an x and a y. Sure, it's a flat surface. Well, what happens to our imaging model when we now are imaging a flat surface? Well, let's take a look. That zero term right here, I've now replaced it with zero, is going to be multiplied by this column. So remember the matrix multiplication? We have row times column, row times column. So the third element in this matrix multiplies the third element here. Well, if this is always zero, well, I don't care what's here, and I may as well just go ahead and ignore that. So the extrinsic matrix when imaging a flat surface with z zeroed out um, looks a little bit different. It looks something like this. Now, something interesting happened here. This extrinsic matrix is now 3 by 3. The intrinsic matrix is 3 by 3, and of course, that's just a scalar over there. So now my imaging model is what? It's this matrix H that is a 3 by 3 matrix. Sure, I'm taking a two-dimensional world and mapping it to a two-dimensional image. And of course, I have that extra dimension because I'm just in homogeneous coordinates. And suddenly, the invertibility of this doesn't seem so far-fetched. If this matrix is invertible, it's a square matrix after all, well, then maybe I can infer from the image something about the world. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, the so-called planar homography. That matrix right there is called a homography. So. If I give you 
a bunch of points in the image corresponding to, say, the corners of a planar surface. And I know what those are in the world because I know it's a parking sign with a certain aspect ratio, um, or I know it's an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. So if I know the, this coordinate right here, the world coordinates, and I know the image coordinates, can I figure out that mapping between the two from a single image? And if I can, then that's gonna be very powerful because it means I can reconstruct the world from only the image um, that I take, and we'll see some examples of that in a few minutes. So the game now is given these corresponding points. I know something about the aspect ratio of the object in the world. I can, of course, measure where it gets image to in the image, and how do I estimate the transformation matrix? And the reason why I think I should be able to do this again is because this transformation matrix is invertible, and so it does seem like I should have a chance here from just a single image. I'm going to um, write down a, an initial constraint that says the cross product between these two vectors, little p, which of course are the image coordinates, and h times p, which of course is the homography times the world co uh, co uh, points. Um, of course, capital letters define world, lowercase letters defines uh, image, should be equal to zero. Why should they be equal to zero? Because they're equal to each other. Little p is equal to hp, and the cross product of two vectors that are equal to each other is equal to zero. And so now what I'm going to do is set up a system of equations to try to give me a constraint on estimating the nine parameters of the homography h1 through hn. So let's write out the matrix multiplication. So rho times column, h1 xw plus h2 yw plus h3. Next row h4, xw, plus h5, yw, plus h6, and so on and so forth. So this now notices just a single vector. Well, sure it is. I have a three by three matrix times a three by one vector. That gives me a three by one vector. And now I have the cross product between this vector, image coordinates, and this homography transformed world coordinates should be equal to zero. And now we just need to write out the cross product to see what comes out of this and how do we estimate and can we estimate the components of the homography, these lowercase h. All right, uh, let me remind you what the, what the cross product looks like. It is the second term of the first vector times the third term of the second vector minus the third term of the first vector times the second term of the second vector, and so on and so forth. So notice that each one of these is taking one term from here and multiplying by one term from here. And if you figure out what the cross product is, look it up on your favorite linear algebra uh, site. And this now is a vector that is the cross product of these. Let me remind you what the cross product is, by the way. It's the vector that is mutually perpendicular to each of the vector. So this vector is mutually perpendicular to this vector and to that vector, and it should be equal to zero. And now we see something really interesting. We have, uh, let's see, I've got y sub s, x sub w, y sub w, um, s, x sub w, y sub w, those are all things that I'm going to be able to measure. I've got points in the world, points in the image. And what I want to know is what are the h1, h2, h3, up to h9. And this is looking an awful lot like a system of linear equations. Yeah, I've got just, everything is multiplying uh, h4. Now this s is a little pesky because it's the homogeneous coordinate. And in reality, what I can measure is xs over s and ys over s. So let's see if we can get rid of that pesky um, s here. So let me remind you that x in the image, the actual coordinate that I, that I measure, x, is xs over s, and y, of course, is ys over s. So if I div divide this uh, component, this component, and this component, each of the three components by s, what is going to happen? Well, that s is going to disappear, that s is going to disappear, and then all the xs's and ys's turn into x and y, that's what I want. That's the image coordinate that I measure, not this thing in homogeneous coordinates. So let's go ahead and divide each of these terms by s, and now things are starting to really look up because now I have uh, y times h7 xw. So that's two things that are known, y and xw times an unknown. And then I have y times yw times h8, two things that I know times an unknown, and so on and so forth. This is a system of linear equations. Um, in the nine unknowns that I have. All right, so let's see what we can do now. 
Now what we're going to do is we're going to take those constraints. That was for one point. Now imagine I have, say, four points, the corners of the uh, no parking sign, for the example, or the corners of an 8.5 by 11 piece of paper. Each one of those will give me three constraints. And so four of them will give me 12 constraints. In fact, three of them will give me nine constraints. So I really only need three. We're going to do four because we want to use all four corners. And now I can pack all of those constraints into this matrix right here with the unknown here. Now notice what I've done here. Uh, these first two rows of the matrix are, if you go back to the previous slide, you'll notice they are the constraints from the previous slide just written out in linear form. And But there was three on the previous slide. In fact, let's go back and take a look. There are three constraints here, but over here on this slide, I only have two constraints. What happened? Well, I'm not going to derive this for you. In fact, this is a good exercise. One of these constraints is linearly dependent on the other. So that is one of them is a linear combination of the other two. And a nice little linear algebraic exercise for you is to figure out or show that that is the case. So in reality, these two, uh, these three constraints are only two constraints. And then I'm going to pack a whole bunch of these together. I've got my unknown vector here, and I have my zeros here. Now, we haven't talked about how to solve this, although we will in a little bit. We'll, we'll eventually be talking about total least squares estimation. But I think you can see that this is a linear system. This is a bunch of things that I know, world coordinates and image coordinates. This is my vector of unknowns. And I want to find the values of h's that drive this to 0. And let me just say, without getting into the details of it, because we'll be talking about this later on, is that this is a total least squares estimation. And the way to solve this is to simply take the minimal eigenvalue, eigenvector of the A transpose A, where A is this matrix. Okay, And again, I'm not going to derive where that comes from. I'll, I'll say it again, that this is a total least squares estimation, um, and we'll be talking about this later on. But for now, I just wanted to show you what the solution looks like and what we can do with this in terms of reasoning about the physical world. So here's the picture we have now. We have something in the world that is a uh, no parking sign that is rectilinear, or a piece of paper, or whatever. And we know that it is being mapped into a uh, distorted view here, when I take a picture of it, say, at an angle like this. And so this H is the homography that maps the world, sorry, the world, into the image. And so now imagine I have this image over here, and I want to ask, well, what did this look like before it got distorted. Because now I've got this sort of weird, perspectively distorted thing having gone through a homography. Well, if I can estimate that homography, well, then I should be able to invert and tell you what it looked like in the world exactly. And all I need to know is the aspect ratio of this thing to do that 3D, actually 2D, but seemingly 3D reconstruction. Okay. So let's see what that's going to look like here um, applied. So here's a picture of a license plate where I have identified the four corners of the license plates. And what you should know is that here in the US, all license plates have a fixed 2 to 1 ratio, which means that I know in the world that this thing has a 2 to 1 ratio. I may not know exactly the dimensions, but I know that it's a rectangle. And even if I didn't know it was a 2 to 1 ratio, I know that it's something rectilinear, and I can set the world coordinates to be, say, a rectangle or a square. And from the world coordinates, which I've specified here, 0, 0, 800, 0, 800, 400, 0, 400, and the estimated distorted coordinates of those four corners, I can estimate the homography from this image, invert that homography, and what do I get? I get a pretty cool image of what that world looked like as if I was standing directly in front of the license plates. Now, there's something going on here that's a little weird. What are those brown streaks that you're seeing across the license plate? Well, those are the two bolts that are bolting that license plate to the front of the car. And why are they smeared out? Well, because they're not part of that planar surface. They're, in fact, protruding. And so they violate the homography. And the reason they look like this is that if they were, in fact, painted on, that's what they would have had looked like from the very beginning when I imaged them like this. So that part doesn't work. But notice that the license plate works. Um, I can read the digits quite nicely. And notice, by the way, at the bottom of the license plate, it's all curled in. Um, that's because this license plate is a little dented at the bottom from banging into something. And so that's why you're seeing a little distortion. 
So notice that even though you have this highly, highly distorted image here, you can reconstruct it because planar surfaces do not fundamentally lose information when they are imaged from world to image, unlike three-dimensional objects, which are fundamentally losing information because that transformation matrix is three by four, not three by three here. So these planar surfaces are very special. All right, I think it's always worth, after you do the mathematics, to look at some code. So let's see what this looks like when we implement it in practice. Um, so here's another sample image of a license plate. License plates are really nice because they're cool. They have a known aspect ratio. And you can, you can imagine forensically why this would be very useful to be able to reason about what a license plate's identity is from just a single image. So let's go ahead and um, write a little bit of code to estimate the homography from an image and then remove that, um, the, the perspective projection and look at the license plate as if we were um, photographing it dead on. I'm going to, I'm going to import uh, uh, OpenCV2 and a couple of other standard libraries. I'm going to load the image and I'm going to display it. And then here I'm going to hardwire the coordinates. I did that by actually writing a little bit of code, which I'm not going to share here, of allowing the user to select those points and then tell me what the image coordinates are. So let's start here with the image coordinates UV. So these coordinates are the, are the horizontal and vertical coordinates of the four points on the corners of the license plate. I told you that the aspect ratio of a license plate in the US is two to one. It's been true for decades. And I'm going to just arbitrarily, the units here are sort of irrelevant. So I'm going to arbitrarily set the units to be um, these right here corresponding to a rectangle in the middle of the image. And I've set these to be pixels. That way I'm not dealing with conversion um, issues. And this exact values of these are simply going to dictate how big will the license plate look when I do the inverse homography and the warping, which you'll see in a minute. So all you have to know is these are the rectilinear coordinates of a rectangle, 100, 100, 400, 100, 400, 200, uh, 100, 200. Um, and these are the image coordinates. And now I'm going to just plot those to make sure that I've actually got them in the right place. Um, so those yellow dots that you see in the image over here um, are the image coordinates. Always, always, always look at your data. Um, when you, when you, uh, it's really easy to just type a bunch of numbers in, but you want to always relate that back to the image to make sure that what you are seeing isn't, what you've entered is in fact what you are seeing. All right, now let's do the hard work of estimating the homography. So I have to build that matrix A where each row, each two rows rather, corresponds to the constraints from a single one of those Im image corners. Right, so I've got my big X, big Y, that's the world coordinates, and I've got my UV, those are the image coordinates. And if you, if you look at this equation here, this looks an awful lot like those two constraints that I showed you in that big A matrix up top. And so I'm going to build this A matrix two lines at a time, two, four, six, eight. Hold on, there's only eight constraints, but I have nine unknowns. What happened here? How did I, I did a little sleight of hand before. The reason why I can get rid of eight constraints is that in total least squares, we assume that the resulting vector is unit length. We'll see that later on, by the way. And so I only need eight constraints because that unit length constraint gives me the additional one. So if you don't, under, if you don't remember or don't know what total least squares is, don't worry about it. But here's all you have to know is that in order to estimate it, you're going to compute the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of A transpose A. That's, of course, a square matrix now. You're going to grab the minimal eigenvalue. Python returns these in, in, in um, rank order. So I'm going to grab the last um, eigenvector corresponding to the minimal eigenvalue. I'm going to reshape um, that to be three by three. Those are the nine coordinates, nine um, uh, components of the homography. And I'm going to compute the inverse of that matrix because the homography told me how to go from world to image. And I want to go from image to world to undo the distortion. And then I'm going to use OpenCV to apply that uh, warping, which is right here. And I'm going to display the result, which is right here. So if I can go back um, a, a slide here, this is the input right here, distorted license plate. Um, I build a matrix, I compute an eigenvector, I warp the image according to the inverse of that transformation, and I get this beautiful rectilinear image as if I was looking directly on it. 
There is the magic of these planar surfaces and planar homography. Unlike imaging full-blown three-dimensional objects, things like me, that post box that I showed you earlier on, when you image a flat surface, a piece of paper, a sign, a license plate, uh, a wall, a painting, a photograph, it is an invertible process. And it is beautifully invertible because you can see it linear algebraically because those flat surfaces don't effectively have a Z component. And so you're taking something that is inherently two-dimensional in the world, imaging it to another two-dimensional plane, and all that you have is planar distortion, which follows the homography, which we can estimate, and the only thing you need to know to estimate it is what is the aspect ratio. And honestly, even if you didn't know the aspect ratio, if you just say it's a square planar surface, you'll be able to reconstruct it within an aspect ratio. And so if you're just trying to reason about something, read something, um, see if it actually is distorted correctly, you don't even need to know the aspect ratio, you just need to know that it is a flat surface. And that is the power of the homography when analyzing these types of planar surface versus full-blown three-dimensional objects.